Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Praise God. Matthew chapter 9, um, verse 2. And behold, they brought him a man sick of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes and uh, said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. But he said, that they may know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, Rise, take up thy bed, go into thy house. And he arose, and they uh, departed unto his house. Um, I think I, I read it from one of the Gospels that... Um, Let's go ahead to Luke's gospel version of this. Luke chapter 5, verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, there were Pharisees. This is my favorite version of this story. There were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now look at this. Let me ask you a question. Who was the power of the Lord present to heal? Pharisees, doctors of the law, and they were come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. The power of the Lord was present to heal them. That town, now we know the story. None of them got healed. Now if the power of the Lord was present to heal them, <clears throat> then it must have been God's will for them to be healed. He sent his power and put it there. But none of them got healed. Okay. Just kind of a get you ready. How about that? And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which was taken from the palsy, and sought by means to bring him in, and to lay him before him. And they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude. There's so many people there. <clears throat> they went up on the house top, let him down through this tiling. Now, you know, they didn't say this. They ripped up the roof. They tore a hole in the roof of the guy's house and then, and then dropped him down. <laughs> Can you imagine we're sitting here one day and all of a sudden we start, and we start hearing a song and start seeing sparks flying and, and all, you know, the building's so full of and then they start dropping some sick guy down in here. And the guy kind of got a picture of what's going on here. And led him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, now here we have, um, this is a corporate faith at operation here. The faith of the people bringing him and the faith of the man that's on the couch. Uh, he's probably, you know, you just don't take, paralytics and drag them up the top of a roof and throw them down through the middle of the stuff. They got to be in, they got to be in on the deal too. All right. <clears throat> he said, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes of the Pharisees began to reason saying, who is this which speaks, speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived the thoughts, he answered and said unto them, what reason you in your heart? Whether is it, whether is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say, rise up and walk. But, the, you know, listen, think about it. He makes a statement asking them, which is easier, to be forgiven or to rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He saith unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. Now, when you get natural and carnal thinking, this makes no sense. How can telling the guy to get up and walk mean you had the power to forgive sins? It's the same sacrifice. The, the same one that was going to bear away their sin was the same one that bore away their sickness. And this is a lesson to the church. The same Jesus that saves people is the same Jesus that heals people. And Jesus said, it's just as easy to get them healed as it is to get them forgiven. That's what he's saying here. There's no difference. To prove to you that I have power to forgive sins, rise up and walk. And he said, which is easier? Immediately, um, rise, take up that couch, go into your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up where upon he lay, departed on his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed and glorified God and filled with fear, saying, we've seen strange things today. I'm telling you, I, I, I just... Okay. I can't fathom that the best they could come up with is we've seen strange things today. 
Some guy comes in, gets let down by the roof. Jesus tells him to get up and walk, and gets up and walk. Been on that case for apparently a, a pretty good long time, and all they can come up with is, we've seen strange things today. Now, what happens there? A lot of times that is, you know, when, you, when you've made up your mind that you're not going to receive something, and you're not going to hear something, and you're not going to receive from someone, you won't ever acknowledge its truth or acknowledge that they're walking with God. You've got you to hedge your bets. And that's what they were doing to Jesus, because they, they were, to them it was blasphemous that he would say, thy sins be forgiven thee. Hallelujah. But I want to I wanna major here. I wanna cut, well, there's two things I want to point out here. Um, the first being, as we said earlier already, um, which is easier? I mean, I, I'm, I'm sorry. He saw their faith. He saw their faith. There is something that we are missing in, in, the, in church is a corporate faith. And I'm not saying it's missing altogether. I'm saying we're letting it slip away from us. A corporate faith of anticipation and expectancy for God to do things that when people come into our midst that have needs, we're, we're, we're in faith together. We're going, we just believe God's going to do something. Amen. Um, <clears throat> we just have this anticipation that, God's going to, that God will work and work with them. You know, we can have the crowd like they had there. They're just looking. They're there as spectators. Power of the Lord's present to heal them. And none of them got healed. You read the whole rest of this out. None of them got healed. They just kind of, we've seen strange things today. And what, now you know, can I say something? Okay, thank you. I asked, could I say something? Nobody just, and it may be because I'm going to say it anyway, but, you know. <laughs> Didn't matter if you said yes or no. Why was the power of the Lord present to heal? See, we don't, we don't analyze stuff enough sometimes. Why would the power of the Lord be present to heal unless there were sick folk there? There would be no need to even say it, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. There were sick people there. There were people with ailments in that, that filled that house. Maybe they had come because they had heard that there was, you know, they, maybe there's some conjurer. They maybe kind of had these ideas that he was some wizard or something. You know, whatever people kind of come up with. They're just, you know, they're not, whatever. But the power of the, God manifest his power and had it available to minister to those people there. Yet only people who came from the outside, see, we saw the real faith. When they got there and they couldn't get in, they were kind of like the one with the issue of blood. They would not take no for answer. They were going to get to where they could get to Jesus. Amen. And so they climbed up on the roof, ripped the roof up, and dropped him down in the middle of it. And, and of course, now he's going to mess with their, he messed with their doctrine. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Okay, I got them all. I got all these lawyers and doctors of the law and Pharisees and all these, you know, and the intelligentsia of, of Scripture and so forth. And, and I'm just going to mess with them a little bit here. He looks over there and goes, he sees their faith. And he says, your sins are forgiven. They've lost it. <clears throat> all they can think about is he's blasphemous. Who can forgive sins, you know, but God and all this kind of stuff. And he says, why are you, why are you reasoning that out? Which is easier? Your sins be forgiven you or rise up and walk. But th you might know that I had the power to forgive sins, rise up and walk. So here we have, we have, we have some dichotomies going on here. We have a group of people who apparently don't have faith to receive. The Bible says nothing about Jesus recognizing the faith of anybody in that room until the guys came down through the roof. We do know before they got there that there were sick folk there because the power of the Lord was present to heal them. We have no record of anybody getting healed except that one man. Why? Because Jesus saw their faith. We cannot approach God, we cannot approach healing, we cannot approach receiving anything from God from the standpoint of um, observing the spectacular you know, and trying to figure out if it's real or not. We have to have an anticipation. And because the four people uh, bringing the guy on the stretcher had faith, and the guy on the stretcher had faith, they received the power that had already been present to heal the other folks in the room. Now, could they have gotten healed? Yeah. If they had, resp if they had responded with faith, um, Kevin Durant told me one time, he, he had gone down to, uh, him and Annie had gone to um, a, a meeting, 
Well, it was, it was a Benny Hinn meeting in Atlanta. And, the, and, the, and the, that, that particular Atlanta Coliseum, I'm not sure which one it was, but one of the, you know, I had about 20,000 people in it. And um, they were there, and, and they got there, and the meeting, nothing was happening, and then they came in, and I said, look, bro, you know, uh, hey, my brother Benny's tied up in the beltway. And if you've been to Atlanta, you, can, you understand that. Uh, the beltway and the throughway and all the interstates around Atlanta, you know, uh, people call it the, world, the world's largest uh, parking lot. Because you can get down there and just get hung up in traffic and sit there forever. You know, and the beltways are supposed to get the traffic around the town, and they're just sitting. They're either moving at 100 miles an hour or no miles an hour. That's your choices on the, on the beltway in Atlanta. We've been on, it. been on the inside running 100 miles an hour, and they're trying to run you off, and then next thing you know, you're running nothing. Okay? And um, they said, well, Brother Benny, he's on the way, but he's hung up in the traffic and can't get here yet, so we're just, you know. And so the people are just sitting there. Now, here's a room, here's, here's a coliseum full of people coming for healing. And all of a sudden, people started popping up all over the building, screaming out that they had just been healed and started calling out different diseases. They just started happening all over. And he wasn't even there. What happened? There was an anticipation that God's power would be made manifest and minister to them. And that anticipation got them over into faith. They started getting healed, and he wasn't even there. Why? It's not the man anyway. Thank God the giftings that God gives me and the impartations that God gives me. But those giftings and impartations are not for the man. They're for the, for the kingdom. And they're, the, and they're to be channels or vessels, probably a better word, vessels, because you, you say channels, you start thinking weird stuff. Vessels of God to d deliver that gifting to the people for the people, not for the man. Amen. But because they got over in the faith and got, got their anticipation out there, they just got, got just stepped right on there and started receiving. But I'm going to tell you, you had a coliseum full of people, full of faith. They, they were expecting things to happen. I've been, I've been in atmospheres like that, where the whole room is charged with an atmosphere of faith. I mean, it's charged with the atmosphere of faith. And I'm going to tell you something, ministering to people in that kind of atmosphere, it's easier than cutting soft butter. I'm telling you, just, it's, just, it's just marvelous. Because, because the atmosphere of faith lends itself to the demonstrations of God. Sister Wilkerson, a number of years ago, uh, she's gone home to be with the Lord now a good number of years. Uh, but uh, I, I had an old tape where she was at Ramah. And uh, she got over into the spirit and began to prophesy about atmosphere. And I... And I, I, I I cannot find it. I wish I could find that tape. Because, you know, it, I mean, it was, I don't know how old it was when I heard it, but it was still, I'd get goosebumps listening to it. The anointing is the anointing. <laughs> and she began to prophesy. She said, atmosphere calleth me. Whether good or evil, it calleth me. She began to prophesy about an atmosphere calling, summoning God. Now, we know the atmosphere of evil can summon judgment. But I can also tell you the atmosphere of faith will summon his, his, his grace and his mercy uh, into a room, into a, into a people. And so here we had, we had you know, the, the power of the Lord present to heal them. And those guys came in with their faith and it summoned, it summoned the power of God to minister to them. We can get over into faith and, get, and uh, we get people anticipating a congregation. And this is, what, this is what we want as a church. We want us to have an expectancy and an anticipation of God working in our midst. Amen. Why? Because that atmosphere will summon him. Oh, glory. I said, oh, glory. That atmosphere will summon the Lord and, and his spirit to begin to minister to people. Well, isn't that what we want? Don't we want people well? Don't we want people delivered? Don't we want, we want people healed? We want them to know the goodness of the Lord. Amen. Isn't that right? And so we as a congregation uh, need to, to get like the four men and the guy on the stretcher and just have an anticipation. When we get, around, when we get together, we're going to get around Jesus and we're going to summon his presence. We're going to summon, we're going to set an atmosphere of faith that where people can come and get healed in. Well, you know, yes, we thank God for the anointing and people being anointed and, and gifts and the spirit and manifestation. But I'm telling you, you, get, you can have an atmosphere that just summons. Now, not, not, don't take this in a disrespectful sense. God responds to faith. 
Let me make a statement. People always say, God's not a respecter of persons. No, he's not. But he is a respecter of faith. That went over like a, a load of bricks. I said, God is not a respecter of persons, but he is a respecter of faith. Faith moves God. And we're not, we're not making God do something. It's, the, it's how he said it. The just shall live by faith. Faith gets God working in your behalf. And he's always dealing with people, trying to get them to the place of faith. What, did, what rebuke did Jesus give in Israel? Think about what he told the disciples when they're in the boat, going over, storm comes up, they come back, you don't care, we're going to die. He gets up, calm, storm turns around, says, where's your faith? Talk to him about, oh, ye of little faith. He was, so, so Jesus marveled, if you look in your Bible, about two things. People under the covenant who lacked faith and the people outside the covenant who had great faith. Amen. Faith summons God. So we can set an atmosphere whereby men and women can be brought into our midst and come in there, and because the atmosphere of faith is so strong, even if their faith is weaker, we can undergird them. Now, I can tell you this now. Uh, how many know that, that the book of Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and says, we have in the same spirit of faith as we believe, therefore we spoke, spoken, we also believe and therefore speak. So having the same spirit of faith. Uh, Mark Brzee, I heard Mark Brzee a number of years ago say this. He said, the word of faith is taught, but the spirit of faith is caught. You get around people of faith, and it'll get on you. I said, you get around people of faith, it'll get off on you. It's a spirit of faith. It'll just get on you, just being around it. You'll begin to see, you'll, it'll, it'll, it'll strengthen you, it'll encourage you. I mean, you've, you know, you got, you've been taught the word of faith, you get around people with the spirit of faith, I mean, it'll get off on you. That's why you can go sit under Dad Hagen and come out and like, get on you. Yeah, there's a spirit of faith on him. There's other men and women of God that have a spirit of faith on them. Not, not just teaching the word of faith, they got a spirit of faith on them. It'll get off on you. Spirit of doubt will too. And unbelief will get off on you if you want, you know. Well, how do you know that? Go back to Numbers and check out the, children, the 12 spies. Ten of them came back with an evil report, brought up an evil report out of the land, and that spirit of doubt got off on the whole congregation. Joshua and Caleb said, let's go up at once and take the whole land. And, and they were, oh, no, we can't do it. We're, we're, you know, we're, we're fodder for the giants, basically. That spirit of doubt got off on them. Joshua and Caleb were, hey, we got it. let's go get it right now. It's ours. But if the people, and I'm going to tell you, if the people had listened to them, they could have gone in and gone ahead and got the land. Never, we would have never had the, the story about the wilderness. They'd have gone in and taken the land if they had listened to Joshua and Caleb. Amen. I said amen. So, with the, with the paralytic here in, in this situation, we have the, the, the doctors and law and so forth all sitting there. And the, um, spirit, the, the power of the Lord is present to heal them. Hallelujah. God comes in. Now, the second thing is this, is healing and, 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 and salvation, healing and, and being born again, having your sins forgiven. Jesus bore away our sin. Can you say amen? But he also bore away our sickness. Now, Jesus equated the ease of, of forgiveness to the ease of healing. Often, we think, heal, you know, we, we think it's harder to get healed, and Jesus said it's just as easy to get healed as it is to get saved. We got people who teach that God doesn't heal, but he does save. Well, well, if you study the word saved, then if, he, if, you just, if you say God sows those, he heals too. Jesus equated them equal. Look, you go back to Psalm 103, verses 2 and 3. Forgiveness and healing are hand in hand. Isaiah 53, healing and forgiveness are hand in hand. 1 Peter 2.24, healing and forgiveness go hand in hand. 
over and over through Scripture, we have that what Jesus talks about right here, that it's just as easy to get folk healed or get them saved. It doesn't matter. It's the same sacrifice that was paid to purchase both. We make it more difficult sometimes just because of what we teach in the church. We make them separate, separate things. Uh, you know, God, God will save you, but he may not want to heal you because, you know, wait a second now. That's like saying, you know, God might heal you, but he may not want to save you. Now think about it now. The way Jesus talked here, they were interchangeable. Just as easy to do one as the other. And the proof that you could do one was in the fact that the other was available, was ministered to. That's what he said. That you may know the Son of Man has power to forgive sins. Get up and walk. That just don't make sense to the natural mind. But the spiritual mind, the spiritually understand, know this. That's because Jesus was able. Uh, there was the same sacrifice being paid. He was a sacrifice. He was bearing away not only our sickness, but he was bearing away our sin. Or maybe I should say it this way. Not only bearing away our sin, he was bearing away our sickness. And because he was bearing away our sickness and sin at the same time, then they're both available with the same ease. Well, how do you get saved? By faith. Then how do you get healed? By faith. Amen. We make, them, we make them different things in the human mind, but they're not in the mind of God. Because when he laid on him the iniquity of us all, by his stripes we were healed. All of our sickness went on Jesus. At the same time, all our sin went on Jesus. Now, you need to get your doctrine right. Because if he bore our sin and God thought the sin was a curse to us, God didn't put sin on you to make you a better Christian. God didn't put, you know, a thieving spirit on you so you can go out and steal so he can teach you how to be a better Christian. He didn't make you a prostitute so you can go out and be a better Christian. Sin is sin. He hates sin. He hates sickness too. How do you know? Because Jesus, the sacrifice, the supreme sacrifice of heaven for all humanity, took our sicknesses at the same time. Therefore, to God, it's just as sickness. Now, now let me say this. God cre created the body and breathed into the breath of life. And the body of man was just as precious to God as his spirit. Now, how do you know that? Well, when you get born again, your spirit gets born of God, you become alive unto God again, but you get sealed with a promise you're going to get a glorified body again. There is a redemption for the body. Ephesians tells us that you know, we have, we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit for the purchased possession, your body. God made provision for the redemption of the body. It's just as valuable to him. So God doesn't, doesn't want, you know, to, to wreak, uh, wreak havoc on the body and destroy it under the guise of us learning some special secret thing that nobody ever learns. What is the Lord's trying to teach you? I don't know, but, I, you know, I'm learning it. Well, how are you going to learn what you don't know you're learning about? See, we get, we get double talking in the church sometimes and confuse everybody, including ourselves. I remember John Osteen a number of years ago, I, was, I heard him teaching on, uh, he had, he got up one Sunday morning and was going to teach on the gifts of the Spirit. Now, now, now John Osteen was, was a Southern Baptist. He used to say, back in the day, he'd say, uh, you know, we were, we were Lakewood Baptist Church. And he said, one day a tornado came by close enough and blew the word Baptist off. We took it as a sign. We just became Lakewood Church. And, uh, but he got up one Sunday morning and started teaching on the gifts of the Spirit. He, started, he, he said, you know, he said tongues were our linguists and, you know, and interpretation of tongues were, you know, interpreters and, and that... Um, <clears throat> Uh, the word of wisdom, where our counselors, word of knowledge, where our, ed where our educational systems. He's saying that you know, the gifts of healing was our doctors and, and uh, working of miracles. He got down in there somewhere and got all befuddled. He just stopped. He said, forget about it, people. I don't have a clue what I'm talking about. Forget everything I said, and we'll see you next week. Come back next week. Walked off the platform. Just walked right off the platform, you know, because he, 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 he realized right in the middle of that he didn't have a clue what he was talking about. He was trying to relegate everything that was supernatural to some natural equivalent, and he just got there and couldn't figure it out. He just gave up. And then he went and got filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Speaking in tongues. Amen. 
Hallelujah. He called himself God's little Baptist. He was baptized in, you know, he was, he was Baptist, he baptized in the body of Christ, baptized in the Holy Ghost, baptized in water. Hallelujah. Amen. Love to hear Brother Osteen preach. John Osteen. Glory to God. Didn't you, Brother Bill? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we understand that Jesus, the Father, remember this, Jesus said, I only do those things I see the Father do, equated forgiving power as the same power that heals. So if somebody goes along and says, God's not healing today, then he ain't, I mean, if God's not, God doesn't heal anymore, then he doesn't save anymore. If Jesus Christ, the head of the church, if the Father, is not healing people today, then he's not saving people. Because it's the same power that does it. According to Jesus, and I don't care how many letters you have behind your name, you don't supersede Jesus. And if Jesus said it's the same, then it's the same. If you went to your theological cemetery and got everything taken out of you and you just preach a dead, dead whatever, I'm telling you, if Jesus said it's the same power that heals, it's the same power that forgives, then it's the same power that heals, it's the same power that forgives. And if you say God's not healing anybody anymore, then God's not saving anybody anymore. And we know that's not true. And he's healing people too. If they'll come just like the four guys with the couch. And the man on it. Amen. And let Jesus see, our, see their faith. Can you say glory to God? We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.